Hey everyone, Duke Nugget 3D here with another mask to review, as well as some future updates to mention for reviews and things to look out for in the future with this channel. But nevertheless, let's get right down to the review. Uh, I'm not going to be going too deep into history on this, because as you can see, it is a M3A1 Army Diaphragm Mask, and if you want to know more about the history of these, you can check out my M3 and M3A1 Army Diaphragm Mask review that I had previously uploaded before this video. But Today I just want to go over this kit because it's special, because not only, not only is it in mint condition, but it also has a few uh, features and accessories that my previous M3A1 diaphragm does not have. So let's get right into it. So I had actually, I was actually not anticipating on getting this kit. Uh, I saw that there was a really cheap unissued M3 diaphragm on eBay, and so I was uh, kind of keeping an eye on it, and I noticed some morons were doing early auto bids, and it's like, you know what, I'm just going to bump these guys up and you know I wasn't I wasn't fully anticipating on paying for this thing but yeah I, I every time one of these boomers auto bid on this dang thing like four days before it actually ended I just went ahead and bumped it all the way up to their maximum auto bid and lo and behold I ended up winning this thing so eh, that's a bit unfortunate but at least I have a mint condition M3A1 with a few features that are not present on my current M3A1 because this is a later contracted mask so Let's start off here with the face form, which you would obviously expect to see with the mask, being that it is unissued. I do not have the retaining cord that it would have been uh, wrapped with to keep it inside, but you know, nevertheless, I have the face form, and these are a bit hard to find on their own. So that's pretty much that. It's made out of a fiberboard material with several tacks holding the various uh, uh, pieces into shape. And there's really not too much else to mention about this. It, all it really is is just a fiberboard face form to prevent the mask from getting deformed while it is in uh, storage or packaging. Up next we have the anti-fogging cloth. And this is not an anti-dimming uh, stick, but just the cloth. Uh, this is when they started to realize, hey, we can put this tacky material on the cloths that will keep the lenses from fogging. So no need to use the sticks anymore. And it, again, being completely unissued, it's in perfect condition. And uh, I don't know if it's usable or not. I don't really intend on using it. I don't really need to because this is just for a uh, mask for display, not really to use. But nevertheless, I have an, a good example of an anti-dimming cloth. Next up here is the carrier, which is actually the thing that I was missing for my M3 and M3A1 diaphragm mask, so I'm glad to have this one so that I can interchange it between my uh, two examples. As you can see, it is marked US with the Chemical Core logo and universal size, and then below that, very faintly, if you can read that, says Army Diaphragm Gas Mask. Now this is a M4A1 carrier, and it has been slightly upgraded from the M4 carrier, which I demonstrated in my M3 and M3A1 review, and I'll be kind of going over the very minute differences the two have. First off, that this one is made out of a more, uh, it's it's made out of a more OG103 color, or perhaps even OG105, I'm not, probably OG103, because it is much more olive drab-ish looking than that uh, M4 carrier, which is much more of a vibrant khaki-ish color, although that, that may be due to discoloration. Uh, other than that, we have, uh, we can see externally that there are some reinforcements, uh, some canvas duck reinforcements around the filter portion of the carrier as this was this the filter would always be in here and reinforcing this very stiffly and therefore as this carrier gets knocked around you would get plenty of wear in fact you can already see some wear on this area where the filter has previously been in so yeah those reinforcements were much needed to protect the carrier from getting frayed and damaged on the flip side we can't really see too much else of importance you have the opening flap here which opens with two snap lifted up fasteners. And you have an additional snap right here uh, for securing the flap when the mask is worn and you need to secure the flap around the hose. And I noticed it's actually on the M4A1, they actually recut the pattern a little bit different so that this fits a bit better. On the M4, it was really tight and I kind of imagine that was due to because they were, the M4 carriers are more for the M1 uh, series uh, uh, service masks, the older ones, so. Uh, the hoses were probably slightly different. On the inside here, you can see uh, M4A1 Arco. I'm not sure what manufacturer that might be. If anyone knows, feel free to leave a comment. And then lot number one. So this is kind of an early carrier. Not early, but kind of an early batch, I suppose. You can see the gray rivets reinforcing the corners of the carrier, which is pretty typical for an M4A1. And then on the inside, there's nothing too much else to see. You can see, hopefully you can, the lower filter strap with the loop for the anti-dimming kit. And another thing they changed from the older M4 is that there are two separate straps for the 
filter instead of just having a lifted out snap right here and a really long strap that goes across uh, the there are two straps which meet halfway across the filter and it is much easier to install that way another interesting thing to note about the internals of the carrier is that there is a small pocket right here towards the bottom and i would assume maybe this is for a waterproofing kit or maybe something else i'm not entirely sure what this little pocket would be for it doesn't seem to fit any known accessories for this mask such as the uh individual uh, blister agent protective cover or the m1 waterproofing kit anything like that i doubt would fit in here so if anyone knows what this little pocket inside of here might be for feel free to leave a suggestion moving on to the more interesting components of the kit let's start off with the filter here and i already said that this mask was mint condition but due to uh age it has caused some of the parts around the uh, y connector here to loosen so the hose was easily able to be pulled off and i'm going to be replacing the wire and tape on this hose i have just removed it for the sake of uh i don't know just reasons i guess make it easier to install and remove but anyways the hose the m2 hose here is, is fairly pliable very pliable a little bit of discoloration but nothing too serious this is an unissued mask after all um let's get down to the filter here because this is the most interesting part for me at least this is an m9a2 filter or mixa2 i guess you could say because it's rome this is still in that weird phase of u.s designations where we're using roman numerals and the m9a2 filters were probably the last filter in the heavyweight series of filters uh before they went to the lightweight series masks with the M10A1 filters. Uh, the M the M9A2 filters are easily distinguished with a yellow painted top over the uh, the older M9A1 filter, which is obviously just olive drab and obviously it's stamped M9A1. I doubt you can see that. Um, got some markings here, lots of lot numbers. I don't know if CWS stands for Chemical Warfare Service. I, I'm willing to bet it does, but don't quote me on that. You got a date stamp of 1944. You got some more lot numbers on the bottom there. You got the inlet valve on the bottom, which is pretty much the same design as the, uh, well, almost the same design as the M9 filter. As you can see, it uses a United Carrier snap to retain that rubber disc in place, whereas uh, this one uses a brass pin that has been uh, sort of riveted, I guess, sort of punched to flare out and retain the uh, inlet valve disc in place. Let's get onto the mask. Uh, there are a couple things different to mention about my previous M3A1 uh, because this is a later, this is a uh, 1943 contract. It's, it's dated 1943, and my earlier M3A1 was dated 1942. And there are a few slight differences. For one thing, the C11 plastic uh, diaphragm angle tube assembly here is a couple millimeters larger. Uh, if you sort of know what I mean when I say the M, if you know about the M2 10.6 lightweight optical mask, that World War II version of the M2 optical mask with the with a similar plastic diaphragm, that's why so many people have had trouble making repros of those, is because the majority of the M3A ones you'll see have the earlier contract uh, C11 angle tubes, which are substantially smaller and therefore will not fit in a M2 optical face piece. So. That's kind of interesting, and there's also, uh, I'll be able to show this off later, but there's a bit of metal reinforcement molded into the plastic, whereas the older uh, C11 angle tubes were just all plastic. There was no reinforcement, and so they had a tendency to warp over time. Uh, although this one is quite a bit warped around the M8 outlet valve uh, seat because the threads are extremely rough. Uh, they, it doesn't want to thread in quite right. I assume that's due to plastic warping, so I had to be really cautious unscrewing this because it was really stuck. And the original outlet valve in here was actually made out of black neoprene, and it's completely rotten, so I replaced that with a spare gray M8 valve I had in my parts box. Uh, moving on, we can see the side of the... Uh, webbing here with some stamps. I don't know what manufacturer that is, but you can see a good profile of the side of the face piece. Nothing interesting to see there. Moving on. Uh, you can see the head harness is upgraded. If you remember my M3A1 that I reviewed in my previous review uh, had a gray M2 or M2A1. I'm pretty sure it's M2A1 harness. I could be wrong. Uh, one of the M2 harnesses, and this one uses the later M7 harness with the triangular oil cloth head pad as used on the M3 and M4 lightweight masks. So that's interesting that these later contract M3s began to utilize newer parts like this. And now I will move on to the inside of the mask and wrap up the review. And I should also mention that 
Sometime after Christmas, I'm going to be expecting another visit from Moulage, and I'm going to be getting a ton of masks off of him as a part of a trade and a sale deal. And I'm also expecting more masks later on this month, not from Moulage as well. So keep your eyes peeled, and I'll be sure to keep you posted about that, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment here. But first, let's look at the inside here. As you can see, or hopefully you can see, you can see that uh, metal reinforcement molded into the plastic that I mentioned before. And another thing is this gray speech cone. I noticed not a lot of M3 diaphragms still have this gray speech cone, so it's very interesting that mine, well obviously mine will still have it because it's unissued, but uh, I'm wondering if that's down to either a manufacturing error or maybe they just didn't include them in early contract M3A1s because they thought they didn't need them or uh, maybe it got lost over time. I'm not entirely sure, but for all sakes and purposes, this one has it, and I'm very thankful because it's a good example of one, obviously. And then lifting that up, you can see the M8 outlet valve port below that. And there really isn't too much else to see. You got a nice texturing as always. You got the TSO deflectors aimed up at the cellulose acetate plastic lenses. And that is pretty much it for the mint condition M3A1 Army diaphragm mask. And uh, as I mentioned before in previous videos, these were used into the 1950s, mostly for training at that point. A lot of them were repurposed for training, uh, but this one is a mint condition example as it would have been issued in mid-World War II. So, that being said, I'll go over what I plan to get in the coming month. Pretty soon here, about next week, I will have access to a, uh, or have in my collection, an M2A1 light, or not lightweight, uh, heavyweight service mask. One of the earlier M2 series masks that I'm going to be restoring before I actually do a review on it. And then, of course, the visit will, with Moulage will uh, accommodate me with several very rare uh, masks, uh, most of which to keep, but some just for me to tinker with and restore, which I will be making reviews on even though I do not own them. And... Here are the masks that you will be want to be keeping an eye out for, aside from the M2A1, which I'll be getting here next week. Uh, I will be hopefully receiving a mint condition M1A1 uh, service mask. I will be getting an Acme model number 6. I will be getting a normal Burel diaphragm mask, similar to the one I have, but I'm trading Moulage back the... Uh, the unpainted one that he had uh, sold me before, so I will have a complete BRL diaphragm mask in the normal configuration to review. Uh, and I will be, let's see, what else am I getting? I'm getting several different things. I can't really remember them all off the top of my head, but there's going to be a lot of interesting things to see, and uh, I'll keep you all posted on that. So, anyways, that's about it. Uh, I'm Duke Nuga 3D. If you have any comments, questions, corrections, or concerns, drop them in the comments below. As always, Merry Christmas, and I'll see you all later.